I'm Ariane Elfant, and this is Death the Podcast. Death may be defined as the destruction or a permanent end of something. At Death the Podcast, we are looking closely at what happens when something ends. We listen, learn about, and discuss the stories that surround the subject of death. These stories bring up much more than feelings of fear and sadness. They offer opportunities for connection, for hope, and sometimes even for humor. Ultimately, if we are open to exploring death, we create greater potential to experience life. My guest today is physician and author, Dr. Jessica Zitter. Dr. Zitter practices critical and palliative care medicine at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. She is the author of Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life. In her book, Dr. Zitter conveys powerfully the message that physicians are not taught how to let patients die. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Huffington Post, Pacific Standard, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. She is also featured in the documentary Extremis. Extremis portrays the tension doctors, patients, and their family members face in end-of-life care. It won top honors at the Tribeca and San Francisco International Film Festivals and is nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Short Subject. I am thrilled today to be able to talk with Dr. Zitter. Welcome. Thank you so much. One of the things that has stayed with me long after watching Extremis is the eye contact that you make with your patients. You're very able to attune to them and to do so with their family members. And in your book, Extreme Measures, you point out that medical training does not prepare you for the psychological and social factors at play within families at the end of life. Where does your ability to do this come from? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. Thank you for asking. You know, I think that I was born as a young child being very interested in the psychodynamics of life and of relationships. And I, I think when I went into medicine, I was sort of taken aback by the fact that that wasn't a part of what we were there to do, or it didn't feel like it was a part of what we were there to do, to really connect and to hold hands and to think about people as people. So it, it was a real jarring experience for me because I'd always been focused on that type of thing before I went to medical school. When you were in medical school, what did it kind of unteach you about being able to connect with people? That's a really great way of putting it. I mean, I think that medical school is a really scary place. Um, all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're really a kid and you, you kind of come out of this college experience and you're all of a sudden in touch and in contact after the first couple of years that you're really mostly in the classroom. But as soon as you come onto the wards in the third and fourth year of medical school, you are, you are really um, witness to this profound suffering that most of us really don't see, um, which is why I think it's, you know, such an important thing as an insider to bring this information out to people because it's not something that most of us ever witness until we have a loved one go into the hospital or get sick and die. So it's a very shocking experience to go from living what most of us, you know, live as, uh, have as a non affected by death existence and then come into this world where you're supposed to be taking care of people who are profoundly suffering and we're really not prepared to do it. Um, we are all of our role models really are there to show us how to do physiology and how to improve organ function. And particularly for me, who went into the ICU, um, that was the focus, was how can we get that last heartbeat out of that person? And um, it, it, it just doesn't prepare you. We're not prepared to handle the suffering that we see. One of the things that, uh, that you talked about in your book, there's like a section entitled uh, Heroic Doctors Ask for Help. And you talk about how in the current medical culture, one doctor is making most of the decisions for a given patient during a particular hospitalization. And you point out how this is too much moral responsibility for one human to hold, that ne medicine needs a mechanism enabling doctors who are managing dying patients to get collegial support. Do you see more of this happening that's a really important topic and a really important point that I want to bring out with my writing and that I want to bring out with my speaking. People see doctors as black and white. You know, either we're 
there to help and we're good doctors and we care about patients, we care about the whole patients, or we're sort of bad, disconnected, cold doctors who don't really care about anything. And I, I just, I think it's so much more nuanced than that. You can't expect one doctor who's already, whose job is to rev up in, in you know, favor of life-saving, all of a sudden to be this only person kind of swinging everything towards a different, well, let's, let's talk about whether or not this really is the right approach. It's, 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 it's number one, it's, it's difficult. Number two, it feels like failure in the way that we've been, you know, this was the goal that we were going towards. So all of a sudden to say, oh, well, that goal actually isn't our goal anymore. We're going to have a new goal. It's just a lot to ask one person to do on their own. And mm -hmm. so I really do believe that we've got to have a whole different infrastructure in the way we support each other and we support the decision-making process. And I think having it be one doctor, one lone doctor is, is just not workable. It's not working. Can I tell you a quick story? Yes. One day, my colleague was leading rounds. I happened to be there and I was listening to him lead rounds. And he's this terrific guy and he was trying to get his team. This patient was doing really, really badly. And they were full court press. It was a young guy. Everybody wanted this guy to come back and live. And, and, and they were doing everything. They'd been treating this guy relentlessly for seven days. And he had been deteriorating and deteriorating and had come to my colleague's sort of understanding. I mean, this guy was not going to make it out of the ICU. But he wanted to sort of talk with his team about it and see what everyone else was thinking and start to think about whether or not the team thought it might be time to start to present a different picture to the family. Instead of the goal is life-saving, maybe we're at a point where that's not one, an option. Let's think about other goals that are more sort of in line with what's going on. And so he asked this big group of people, and I was standing right there, it included all the residents, there was a couple of medical students, there was an, um, our pharmacist who's terrific, a bunch of people, and the nurse was standing there. And he said, okay, um, tell me guys, what do you think is going to happen with this patient? Does anyone think that, you know, how are things going? And, you know, everyone was silent. And he said, well, well, well right, let me ask you a little more specific question. Do you, do you think this patient is, is starting to do badly? Total silence. And my, he told me, he said, you know, I just have to tell you, it was really uncomfortable. I felt like, a feeling that's very common to me, by the way. He said, I felt like they thought I was kind of a wimp, kind of a loser. Like, here I am, like, ready to give up on this guy. He's 34 years old, and, you know, we could save this guy. We're going for... And he said, I, I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. So he takes a piece of paper, and he rips it up into eight pieces, and he passes a piece out to each person who's standing there. He says, guys... I want you on a scale to write on a scale from one to 10, how likely you think it is that this guy's going to get out of this hospital, get out of this ICU, get off that ventilator. Every single person wrote either a one or a two. Most people wrote one, meaning no way. Mm -hmm. So here's this team. There's this consensus in everyone's head. This guy's dying. No one's willing to admit it. And this attending, who's extremely experienced and who knew that this patient was dying, needed the support of his team to be able to say, okay, it's time for us to start to change our orientation and to start to present a different picture to this family. And he needed the support even of his medical student. It's really hard to do this stuff by yourself. It's really hard. I would think it would be next to impossible. I think a lot of us take for granted that when it is suggested that something be done medically, that we just say, yes, OK, without really understanding what the medical procedure is at all. And that if we understood as a caregiver or even as the patient um, what what that was, that we might make a really different decision. We We have data to prove that that's true. Data after data after data. Pretty much. You know, most of the palliative care data that we have shows that when patients have knowledge about the benefits and burdens of various procedures, they tend to, not everyone, of course, but a lot of people choose a much lower level of intensity of, of treatment. Um, so, you know, or, or, a, or a change in goals of care altogether towards more of a comfort approach. So we know that, you know, when people do understand um, what, 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 what it is that, that they're signing up for, they, they are much less likely to want it. One of the messages I hope that this book brings to people is I want people to stand up and ask and say, hey, you know what? 
can you tell me what you're really thinking, doc? I want people to understand that their doctors may not be able, but they may not, they may not have the skills to tell them that bad news. Sometimes the patient needs to be brave enough to ask for it. I think that will go a long way in helping to enhance the communication that we need in order to allow people to access a better path to the end of life. And I loved in your book that you kind of shared some about your journey of being from a long line of doctors, surgeons, choosing the, a different path, the path that you chose. And you write about um, saving your grandmother your third year. You know, that piece was one of the most incredible pieces that I, I can remember writing. It's just really the, you know, 10 year, almost 10 years apart, these two grandmothers of mine dying uh, in very, very different ways and with me playing very different roles. It was sort of uh, my first grandmother when I was a third year resident, just getting ready to go. I had just made the decision that I was going into intensive care and I was really all about life saving. And my grandmother was um, had this operation on her colon and she was supposedly cured. She had a small cancer and they resected it and she was doing great. And we were with her for a couple of days and then we were getting ready to fly back down to Boston, my aunt and I. And my grandmother, um, we went to say goodbye to her and she was clearly not doing well. Something very serious had happened. Uh, we, we found out that she had fallen out of her bed and um, she had she was babbling incoherently. She, her, she had no blood pressure. She was cold and clammy and she was in shock. Probably what happened was that her, well, we know what happened because she we found out that her stitches of her colon had ripped open and she had had, you know, um, uh, the contents of her colon go into her abdomen, which is extremely dangerous. And, and, and she had no urine output. I mean, things were very bad. And so there was nobody around. It was Canadian Thanksgiving and the hospital was very close. It was like one of those, those scary shows where you come in and you're in a hospital and it's dark and no one's around. You're like, doctor, doctor. And there's nobody there. And it was like that. And I, I came out into the hallway saying, oh my gosh, somebody, please help me. There was nobody there. And finally I found the nurse and I said, my, my grandmother is, is, there's something wrong. I don't know what happened. She said, oh, she fell out of bed. And then I, re, I sort of started putting together what had happened to her. I said, we've got to give her fluids, you know, call the, call the residents. Can you start fluids? And she, usually people won't listen to another doctor, but she under, she's like, oh my goodness, you're right. We start fluids. This, we start to, you know, try to get her under control. And finally I got, I called the attending surgeon and I told him the story. And within 30 minutes, she was in the operating room, um, on the, on the operating room table and they saved her life. Um, and she went on to live another 10 years and, you know, here I was this little, you know, kid, basically, you know, young doctor, uh, and I mobilized an entire surgical team on Canadian Thanksgiving to get my grandmother <laughs> her, <laughs> to get her life saved. And, you know, fast forward 10 years. And by this point, I'm trying to remember exactly what year it was. At this point, I was a palliative care attend. Was I a palliative care? I was, I was just starting to be very interested in palliative care. I was working with a lot of people at U university hospital, um, to learn palliative care skills. And I don't remember if I had actually gotten my palliative care boards or not, but my grandmother who had very profound dementia, this is my other grandmother was dying and we had put her in hospice several months earlier. And she was having a very comfortable ending of her life, although she was very demented and she's developed a pneumonia, which is again, very common with people with dementia. And she had been put in the sort of acute care facility for the hospice. And I came to, to visit her. And again, there was nobody there because it was Friday night and she had, it was a sort of a Jewish hospital and there weren't people there. And so again, I, I, my grandmother is, is, is really, really short of breath and barely and very uncomfortable. And, you know, now I'm seeing, oh my goodness, in this, we need some morphine. We need to get my, my grandmother comfortable. And the nurses who were there l looked at me very, very suspiciously. You know, I kept saying, please, can you give her some morphine? Well, we, we got to talk to the doctor and he's not calling us back. I said, listen, she's, she's unable to breathe. She's so uncomfortable. They finally gave her a tiny dose of morphine. And then again, an hour later, she was in the same condition. I said, she really needs more morphine. And they saw me, you could, they were whispering behind the nurse's station and, and very suspicious of me that somehow who's this granddaughter flying in from California and, and telling us to give her grandma, her, her grandmother morphine. What kind of a person is this? She's trying to kill her grandmother. Well, clearly I wasn't trying to kill my grandmother. You know, morphine doesn't 
hasten death. It is something where if you use it in a judicious way, which we do in palliative care to manage symptoms, it doesn't hasten death at all. In fact, it 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 keeps people very calm and comfortable so that they die when it's their time, but but much more comfortably. And it was a terrible experience because my grandmother didn't die very comfortably. She had a very, very uncomfortable uh, feeling of suffocation until she died. And I can't, I couldn't help but contrast those two experiences with my two grandmothers. Uh, one where it was incredibly easy for me to get the support of all the healthcare professionals to do some, what needed to be done for my grandmother, which was to save her life. And in this situation with my other grandmother, it was essentially impossible for me to get the medications that she needed to keep her comfortable before she died to save her death. And it was just a very distressing experience for me. How interesting that you were you were present, so present for both of them. I mean, in the front lines for both of them. Very, very strange. And you know, one of the things I'll tell you about my book, <laughs> I was saying to my husband, if you didn't know me, one of the fears I have about people reading my book is that they're not going to believe what I'm saying. <laughs> because, did you see? Did you see the movie? Um, well, Forrest Gump, for example. Oh yes. <laughs> the, the guy, he's in, he's in all the right places at the right, right time. Right. As I was writing my book, I was like, I couldn't believe the coincidence of so many aspects of my life in relation to the palliative care movement that I had been at Case Western Reserve University when Al Connors was one of had was leading Case Western's hospital Metro Hospital it, as one of five centers in the country for the for the support trial which was this huge groundbreaking trial about palliative care and I he was my attending while he was collecting data showing how terribly people were dying. He was my ICU attending. He was teaching me how to put in the Swan Gans catheter. And then as the data started coming out several years later and showed that not only were people dying terribly in the intensive care unit where he had been teaching me, but the Swan Gans catheter, which we had been using left and right, which he had personally taught me how to use, was debunked as not this miracle technology, but actually a technology that was causing death that was that was not only not benefiting people, but was actually harming them and 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 increasing mortality by a rate of 24 percent. So this was all happening when I was a medical student. The data came out from that trial when I was a fellow in um, in in UCSF, and of course I didn't read it until many many years later when I was interested in palliative care. Um, and then that I was at UMDNJ in Newark right when they started their grant, that Robert Wood Johnson grant about enhancing communication in the intensive care unit. Um, and, and Pat, you know, this was 2003, way before palliative care became officially recognized as a subspecialty, but that I was there, that was one of, again, four institutions that got that prestigious grant. This little, this little hospital in Newark, New Jersey, I happened to be there. It, 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 the coincidence is almost too great. And it, 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 I worry, one of my biggest fears, if you had to ask me about this book, is that people aren't going to believe <laughs> the, the things that I'm saying. They're really true. I'm telling you, it really happened. You can ask anybody. But it's a really interesting coincidence, it, a well, lot of these things. I, I mean, I walked away, and, and maybe this is just my lens, but I walked away feeling like, man, this was this makes me believe in people's callings to do what they do. Because not only are you clearly very gifted at what you do and you have a way of languaging it that is so helpful um but yeah it keeps crossing your threshold <laughs> at, 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 at every turn and that that's remarkable yeah. it is remarkable and it, you know i wouldn't call myself a religious person um i'm definitely i i'm a jew and i'm very connected to my culture um, and I go to synagogue a lot, but I am very, very agnostic. I sometimes, but this is one of those things I feel like what, there was something that was saying, you know, you really need to get involved in this, in this, in this work. And uh, it does, it feels very strange. <laughs> it's a very strange thing. Just so many coincidences. And, and it really takes writing a book to kind of collate them, to put them all in one place and see this sort of weird pattern which, which actually is quite funny in, to me, uh, just the level, the number of coincidences that, that, you know, that came across my threshold. Does doing this work uh, make you think more or less about your own death? More, for sure. I think it's about practicing 
And I feel that now I've practiced and practiced thinking about my own death. It's not what I like to do. I don't like coming home and talking about death at the Shabbat dinner table, which I do frequently. <laughs> um, you know, I don't like it when my kid says to me, Mom, can we have one Shabbat dinner where we don't talk about death? <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, it's that rehearsal of, of, that, of those moments, which are inevitable, that I hope will make it easier for me to confront my own death when it starts to happen. I mean, it's happening every, you know, we are all dying at some point. I don't want to sound morbid, but when I really start to die, when it's time for me to start thinking about, will, it, do I really want to be using breathing machines? I mean, right now, of course, I would say, of course, use everything. Try to, you know, and, and most of us, you know, would say that if we're relatively functional, but um, there will come a, t a point where I have to say, you know what, I don't think it is appropriate now for me to, to do that. It's not in, in line with my goals. And I feel that th the frequent thinking and thought that I give to this topic and, and really seeing that dichotomy of choice, like what do I see when people do stick their heads in the sand? It's not good. I will tell you something. I preside over those deaths. I wouldn't want that. I do not want that period end of discussion. Mm -hmm. And my family knows that with some degree of detail. Um, and I think that I hope that I won't die that way because it's not the way I want to die. I think all those Shabbat dinners are going to pay off. It sounds like good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I cannot end this without talking about um, the appendices to your book because I feel like if for no other reason – People should buy this book because of Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. They're, they're so great. I wish that I had had access to them um, before before reading it. But I just wanted to, the Appendix 1 called A Way Forward um, gives the reader a guided step-by-step -step to be in the driver's seat of one's own end-of-life care. And I love the way you do it. it. just gave a lot of clarity to a lot of mush in my brain um, and also offered a lot of knowledge that, that I don't have and I feel like that a lot of people don't have. Um, and then Appendix 2, Avoiding Unnecessary Suffering, goes through very specific problems that come up and the role that hospice and palliative care can provide in addressing those problems. And in doing the show, I think a lot of what we have, have realized and the people we've talked to and the feedback we've gotten is that people don't really understand what hospice and palliative care can do, should do, when they can. Um, I felt like that helped in the grayness of all of it. Um, what drove making those two appendices for you? Oh, well, I, first of all, I cannot tell you how happy it makes me to hear you say that, that I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a secret, which is I wasn't going to write appendices to this book. And it was probably two weeks before the book was due. And I said, I can't put this book out here without appendices. I have to give people a way forward. <laughs> <laughs> and I really um, scrambled to put them together. And, um, I'm so glad I did because I honestly think it would have been irresponsible for me to put this book out without appendices. And I'm so glad to hear that you find them helpful, uh, because it is important that we take this, you know, the mush that's in all of our brains and, and even the, the, the story compilation that's in the, it, that's in the book, which I hope is compelling in terms of its narrative form, but put it into something that you can walk away with and say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, people, the, the, the name, if I, the name of this whole game here is empowerment. It, it's, it's about what I care about more than anything is I care about giving people a way forward, giving people um, a handbook to making this work better. And, you know, there's a lot of handbooks out there talking about advanced care planning and thinking about this stuff. But one of the things I noticed, I mean, and I know as an ICU doctor, is, is this one phrase, the best laid plans of mice and men, or the best laid plans can go to waste, basically, in the environment of extremis. Donna, in the movie, had been talking about her end-of-life goals and, and values for years with her brother. She knew. She knew she had a genetic disease, right? She had a deteriorating neurological, progressive neurological dysfunction. She had been getting weak for years. She had watched her father, her cousin, her sister all die on ventilators. She had seen 
the devastation that comes with living on a ventilator and dying on a ventilator. She did not want it for herself. And she had told her brother Gordon, who she lived with for, I think, a year or two before she died, you have to be strong. You have to stand up and against the family. If they insist that I stay, you know, I don't want to be on a machine. I don't want to live on a machine. So when she came in, in respiratory failure and got immediately put on a breathing machine, which was, you know, what we do, um, there had been no pulsed form filled out there. How, she didn't even know what a pulsed form was. A pulsed form, which is the physician order for life-sustaining treatment, which tells, you know, first responders like EMTs, paramedics, and emergency room doctors, this person does not want to be intubated. It's a doctor's order. It has to be abided by. Hadn't even been a consideration. She didn't know. She thought that telling her brother would be enough. But her loving brother brought her to the emergency room because she was really suffering. In fact, I think it was a 911 call, and they intubated her. And then the decision was, okay, now what do we do? And so, you know, there was um, this hope that, well, there's, you know, an article that says there's the team, there's an article that says there's a 20% chance that people with this particular condition can eventually come off the breathing machine. Okay. But was she willing to take that 20% chance? There's an 80% chance that she won't come off the breathing machine and that she will live exactly the way that she told her brother she didn't want to live. But all that he heard was that there was a 20% chance. And as a loving brother who cared so much about her, he said, okay, and so it took really delving in and trying to kind of figure it out, you know, with all the different communication strategies that we had that you see in the film, what Donna really wanted and really talking more with her brother and explaining the burdens and the risks of the treatments that we were planning to do, the trach, et cetera, for him to say, oh my gosh, she didn't want this. And, you know, that's what I mean when I say the best laid plans. Here's a person who really did talk about this stuff, who knew she was dying. Her brother knew she was dying. But when it came to the moments of crisis and the extremis and the respiratory failure, things go out the window. Mm -hmm. And you can't just rely on things working themselves out. You have to, we have to be in the driver's seat. And that's what I'm hoping that these appendices are doing for people. I think I think they're great. I think that they they make something that feels way too overwhelming, like being in the driver's seat. What does that mean? What do I do? How do I do it? Okay, I'm just not going to deal. Um, that it breaks it down <laughs> into something that right. feels tangible. Um, right. And again, not 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 actually. I like the narrative that goes the reading your book beforehand gives the appendices then such a richness, but also. I didn't feel it just wasn't it wasn't dark going through it. I just felt like this is so helpful. This also gives me something to give other people who I can already think of that I would like to give these to. Um, so thank you. Oh, thank you. That really <laughs> means that means so much. And I'm I'm so happy that I wrote them in those last two. <laughs> I really am. Thank you, Dr. Jessica Zitter. Thanks so much for joining me today. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. The word death evokes all sorts of personal feelings, images, and stories. These stories are amazing, and sharing them connects us more fully to life. I'm Ariane Elfant, and you have been listening to Death the Podcast. Join us for our next episode in this series. This show is produced and engineered by Eric Merle. Our associate producer is Jill Gross. Our theme music, It Happened, is written by David Milling and is performed by David Milling and Charles Milling. To hear more of David's music, go to his website, davidmilling.com. Our social media director is Jolie Robichaud. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or some other podcast app, if you could take a moment to rate and review us, that helps other people find us. You can find Death the Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or at deaththepodcast.com. Death the Podcast is a production of INO Broadcasting.
You know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.